topic today is the stalled farm bill and the implications of what happens if it doesn't pass or what might happen if it does. Uh, uh, Professor Mbachwick? Yeah, so uh, uh, this is a small group and I'm not a, a real guy who's all that interested in formality anyway. So what I would very much like to do is just uh, open it up for whatever questions uh, you want to pose to me. And if I know the answer, I'll wax poetic. And if I don't, we can find something I can talk about. Uh, perhaps a little uh, in way of background that might uh, be helpful. Uh, I've been on the uh, Cornell faculty for about 35 years now, uh, professor of agricultural economics in something called the uh, Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management. Uh, New York, of course, has a very long uh, uh, history in the dairy industry and uh, has always had somebody who paid attention to dairy, and I'm the guy that's, that's doing that now. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin and have my, my dairy roots there and came to Cornell via Purdue, uh, so uh, I have a little appreciation for Midwestern agriculture. Um, I, uh, I'm a guy who... Uh, likes to talk to farmers, but I don't talk to them about farming. I talk to them about what happens to the milk after they leave the farm. I'm interested in dairy foods processing, dairy food marketing, uh, uh, agricultural policy, uh, and a, um, a certain amount of work at the consumer level as well. Um, I don't uh, uh, claim uh, a similar level of expertise across all agricultural policy, but I, I try to pay attention to that as well and certainly uh, I uh, uh, would be happy to chat with you about some of those issues. Um, um, food assistance programs, both uh, domestic and international, are, uh, have actually some particular relevance to dairy and some connection to dairy, and have been a thing I've been interested in for a while. And of course, uh, those programs, domestic uh, food assistance programs, are incredibly important for New York as well. And um, so I'd be happy to, to talk with you about some of those to the extent that I've got any knowledge to share. So that's me. And uh, uh, at this point, well, what do you want to talk about? You know, just to bring me up to speed, because I'm, I'm far behind the pack, what's your understanding of the key differences between the House and the Senate and their dairy approach? Well, it, it's a, that's a, one of the simpler stories, uh, especially in Title I. Uh, and, and let me preface it with a little explanation of how it got there. Uh, the experience of 2009 and actually really starting in 2007 with the big run-up in, in corn prices and all the other feed prices uh, created a level of stress for dairy that uh, was pretty close to unprecedented. You, you have to go back to the early 1970s to see anything similar. And that exposed the fact that the programs, the dairy policies that were in place were completely inadequate to helping dairy farmers under that circumstance. Those programs were price oriented, milk price oriented, and they had no way of, of dealing with the fact that when the corn price goes up and your margin gets squeezed when it goes you know, to zero, um, you, you can't uh, deal with that in the framework of these programs. On top of that, the dairy price support program, the venerable old program that uh, is our poster child for the dairy cliff, had become radioactive in the 1980s and it would really, theoretically you could do something with it, but actually you couldn't. And so the industry decided to develop an alternative approach and they came up with this idea, this income over feed cost idea. They portrayed it as an insurance-like program that would kick in when a national benchmark margin fell below a certain level and farmers could uh, acquire higher levels of protection for increasing levels of premiums, um, and that was the plan. There was a group of, of producers in a very grassroots effort who argued that that was fine and, and good, and you know we understand where that comes from, but it wasn't enough. And they advocated for more of a supply control type measure. Uh, this created quite a controversy within the dairy community, but ultimately the National Milk Producers Federation decided they needed to own that idea as well. They had developed the insurance idea uh, and they decided that uh, to keep 
the dairy industry at the producer level together and on the same page that they would come up with a, a supply management kind of a proposal. They crafted one that was different than what had been floating around. In fact, it actually had even been introduced uh, 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 as a formal bill. And that became the foundation for what was called the Dairy Security Act. Uh, uh, Colin Peterson uh, embraced that approach and introduced it into the House. And that set the stage for a debate uh, about the bill where pretty much everybody agreed the old programs needed to go away. The margin insurance idea was appealing, uh, kind of fits in with what we do with the rest of agriculture. It deals with the issue of how does a livestock producer handle uh, increased feed costs. So that was not a bone of contention particularly, but uh, then the, the supply management part became a big bone of contention. Um, the processor-led group fought it bitterly. Uh, they actually, at the end of the day, formed an alliance with more consumer-oriented folks who saw it as a threat to increasing milk prices. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Speaker Boehner very famously was opposed to the supply control part and uh, characterized it as a Soviet-style economic policy. And uh, so we ended up with a Senate embracing a bill that actually Representative Colin Peterson introduced and championed, and the House went with an alternative that has a margin program that's a little different, but more similar than different, and no, no so-called market stabilization. And so that's what we're conferencing now and trying to debate uh, which way to go. What would be the impact, let's say, like bean foods in Texas? <clears throat> I mean, how, would, how is the real impact of it? If one versus the other? That's a, that's a good question, and uh, I think there are a lot of people that offer answers to that, but if we're honest, we have to say we, don't, we can't really predict that with a lot of confidence. The key, of course, is how many farmers are going to sign up for this program. Let's suppose we go with the Senate version, wh which combines the two. You can't get the insurance without um, exposing yourself to the market stabilization. It's a joint deal. One's a carrot, one's a stick. The concept of market stabilization is if you're in a period of low margin, uh, let's do something to try to lift the price of milk to make that period shorter, reduce government costs, and uh, the way we're going to achieve that is by restricting supply. Well, you talk that over and you go, well, what if I didn't increase my supply? What if I'm just doing what I always did? I mean, is it my fault? Uh, let's, let's focus this on the guys who grow. So uh, National Milk crafted a proposal focused on growing farmers being the ones that would receive penalties, and they, hence they call it growth management instead of supply management. If I'm a growing producer, if I anticipate being a growing producer, if I'm concerned about being penalized because I'm a growing producer, I don't have to sign up for the margin insurance program. If I don't sign up for the margin insurance program, then there really is no effective constraint on production or supply or marketings. So you have no supply effect. It doesn't happen. Now the debate is, is, those, is that margin insurance program so attractive that you couldn't afford to not have it. And there's been some, some analysis, some good analysis done to suggest that might in fact be the case. Uh, then you might see somebody saying, well, okay, I know I'm gonna get penalized, but uh, net net, it's worth it to me. All right, now they're in. Next question is, okay, a, a penalty period comes in where I could deliver milk and not get paid for it, what do I do? I can deliver the milk, completely legal to deliver the milk, but you won't get paid for it. The processor pays USDA for the milk that you delivered because the processor doesn't get it for free. In that scenario, USDA starts accumulating a lot of money and they're supposed to do demand-oriented programs. A little vague what those would be, but the idea is let's stimulate price by doing something on the demand side. I don't know, I can't imagine anybody would expect that USDA is going to get that figured out, you know, like really quickly. So you'd have a real lag effect. You could have a real kind of watching the batter hit the ball while you're sitting in a center field bleachers thing going on where the timing of that is awkward. Farmer says, I'm not going to deliver milk if I don't get paid for it. 
so you have a production cutback. Now you have a market effect, and you know that milk didn't didn't come. Somebody gets shorted on a supply, and so yeah, that could have a, a market effect. A third option is actually the mark the milk finds its way to the marketplace some other way, and uh, you don't have any supply effect. You don't have any demand generation. You just have the same old milk coming out of the marketplace. So. First you have to figure out participation, then you have to figure out strategy of the participants. And there's a lot of uh, room to play there. Um, my expectation is that there would be very little market price effect because one way or another, farmers that grow wouldn't participate or would find other ways to market the milk. And where it would be most annoying is what I call the aha farmers, the ones who signed up because they said I'm not growing and then all of a sudden they found out in a penalty period their milk production was greater than it was the previous uh, quarter or the previous year as a big surprise to them because last year was a drought, this year it was great, uh, you know, we had a whole bunch of twins that uh, came online, uh, you know, we had 55% uh, females instead of 49%, whatever kinds of reasons that would give you more production. And those guys would be the ones uh, that I think would feel like what the heck happened to me? You know, I, I got stuck here and I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't expect to. So those are the things you get into with that, with that so-called growth management analysis. Uh, between, excuse me, I'm just gonna follow up a little bit. <clears throat> with regard to the House and the Senate proposals, is there, in your mind, a rational and politically feasible hybrid between the two, or is it simply either or? Pretty hard to think of, of a little bit of growth management. Uh, and certainly the principles involved and, and the groups promoting their ideas aren't thinking in terms of compromise at all. They're thinking in terms of either or. Now, although the margin insurance programs are really similar, uh, certainly the House bill was based on uh, the Dairy Security Act, they're not the same. And there definitely are all kinds of opportunities to find a compromise between the different versions of margin insurance and, and still stay faithful to the concept. But the market stabilization one is pretty much either or, I think. Congressman Peterson said, told reporters yesterday that the dairy issue is resolved. I've heard that also. Um, but he wouldn't give details. Do you have any idea of how they, it's, it's kind of like Mike's question, how could they deal with this? Yeah. Um, I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is if Colin Peterson is talking about dairy and saying it's resolved, that means he got what he wanted. I don't know if he's talked to his friend John Boehner about this resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a polit uh, uh, well, uh, just to, I don't know whether you're the right person to ask this, but it's very interesting that for the first time in at least many, many years, there's a, there's a New York senator on the Senate Ag Committee. There are several New Yorkers on the House Ag Committee. Uh, from a political perspective, it seems like New York has ignored agriculture for a long time. So, I mean, this is kind of, could you talk, uh, do you have any idea why this is so, why these members have decided it's attractive to appear? to be on the agriculture committees? Has, is, the, is the position of agriculture uh, in New York changing in terms of politics, the public, et cetera? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, New York, of course, is not an agricultural state in the way in Iowa or Texas or California is. But nevertheless, agriculture is an important part of the New York fabric, and there's a lot of history and tradition uh, certainly in dairy, but also in tree fruits, uh, uh, grape and winery industries. Uh, a lot of New York agriculture is outside of major crops. Um, in fact, you know, dairy is uh, really outside of major crops. So when you think of the typical Title I programs, uh, you don't think of, of New York uh, agriculture. But if you're a, uh, an elected official who is concerned about upstate New York, you have to pay some attention to agriculture. Uh, New York State is an agricultural state and its rural communities depend uh, on agriculture in much the same way that other states do. Uh, 
In, uh, among our two senators, uh, both uh, Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand uh, pay a lot of attention upstate New York, and I think Senator Gillibrand in particular saw an opportunity to do something that Senator Schumer didn't have uh, occasion to do as leadership responsibilities dragged him in other areas, and she said, hey, you know, I'll do this. And when you recognize that 80 percent of, uh, of the funding associated with uh, the so-called Farm Bill is nutrition programs, and Senator Joe Brand is keenly, keenly interested in those programs, it makes sense to be on the authorizing committee. Uh, the congressmen who, who have been or are on uh, the House Ag Committee come from rural parts of the state, and they have uh, western New York, northern New York, and uh, they have constituents that, that have said, it's really important to us to have representation. Would you please spend some time with that? And a couple have said, yeah, well, I'll do that. Uh, the last one who, who really paid attention to agriculture uh, and was a senior member with Sherry um, Bollert, although he never was on the Ag Committee. He paid a lot of attention to agriculture, and now we finally got some folks uh, who are on the Ag Committee, and, and they're being rewarded for it. I mean, they're, they're, it, was, it was very much in response to constituent request. I noticed this starting to change with Hillary Clinton, because even though she wasn't on the committee, she started this New York Ag Day event and all of this. Um, I was once in Buffalo doing some interviews when, well, when, when, Cl when Clinton was running for her second term, mm -hmm. and I had these two Republican businessmen say to me, look, uh, no, we have to say, uh, Hillary has paid more attention to upstate New York than, uh, than anybody else, than Moynihan ever did, than um, D'Amato ever did. Uh, but, you know, we just have to admit that. Uh, so, but so I was just a bit, so it does seem like there is a change, and I'm just wondering: Do you think it's is it also the foodie movement? I mean, is it uh, is there something that has happened in New York that is different from what from the way the state was oriented maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago? You know, the uh, the interest in local foods heightens awareness about how food is produced. But Senator Gillibrand, and for that matter, Senator Clinton, uh, when they thought about agriculture and were responding to constituents, they were talking about, they were working with mainstream agriculture. And uh, I would say that organizations like New York Farm Bureau, uh, the dairy marketing cooperatives, the apple growers, um, the Wine Grape Foundation, these were all entities that were working for a long time to encourage more involvement by elected officials. And um, uh, the, the, the local foods thing might have been a, a somewhat of a, a catalyst to some of that, but I think it's really more the fruit of, of mainstream traditional agriculture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. California dairy production is different in a couple of different respects. It's got its own market in order. It's, it's characterized by large size. Have you observed any uh, dis um, degree to which they've broken apart from the other lobbying coalitions on the dairy component of this bill? Uh, there's a lot of regionalism in uh, various different venues and forms, uh, especially around Title I programs. And in some ways, I don't know that California stands apart from that. But uh, uh, to, the, to your question specifically, uh, in, in some ways, California's differences, their degree of state regulation, doesn't change what they advocate. It changes whether or not they play the game. When there are discussions about federal milk marketing order issues, which can be pretty intense at times, they sit on the sidelines and go, um, we're not involved. So they just withdraw from that. Uh, it was Californians that were actually very important in developing the original idea on supply management, believe it or not, uh, seems uncharacteristic, but it was. And uh, uh, so they, they were a, a very important catalyst to get that in, and, and Representative Jim Costas was, was their champion and, and did a, a lot to get that to na a national level of attention. Uh, uh, the California market uh, probably is at the forefront of developing export markets for the U.S. dairy industry. 
So they become much more interested in what are the implications for exports, what's happening to trade assistance programs. So their unique characteristic does pull them in different directions. At, at one point, and I, I've lost track of it, at one point I think Congressman Valadeo from California had offered a, a provision that would uh, authorize a California vote on entering the federal mark, marketing system, mm -hmm. at which he, he Congressman Valadeo essentially cast that as leverage. Apparently there's some state issues going on. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, um, uh, there is no need for any additional legislation for California to petition for a federal order. That can happen under federal law anytime. Uh, a petition is sent to the Secretary of Agriculture. The Secretary of Agriculture uh, would generally look at its merits. You know, if it's one guy writing in saying, I want a federal order, that doesn't really constitute a groundswell of support. But if it looks like there's a, a significant, it doesn't have to be a majority, but a significant interest, the secretary can uh, initiate what's called a promulgation hearing to start a new order. State of California has nothing to say about that. Uh, that's entirely under federal law. The, the uh, uh, legislative activity that you're talking about was to create legislation that would clarify whether or not a certain provision that exists in California's law could be included in a federal order. It w it's a provision that actually federal orders had done historically but currently are not doing. And so that was a, a really a kind of a small issue around sort of a technical point that was really permissive in, in expanding the scope of what kind of order could be written. But, um, the USDA can initiate a promulgation hearing uh, at any time. And given Secretary Ross's recent uh, statements uh, that suggest she doesn't support a California pricing system, I, I think it's much more certain now that USDA will face a request for a promulgation hearing. Um, over what time frame do you, would you expect that? Uh, I think a, a request for a promulgation hearing could happen uh, any time in the next several months. Um, uh, a promulgation hearing is a, is a kind of a complicated affair. It's a very formal process, uses uh, formal rulemaking procedures, which are required uh, by uh, the Agricultural Marketing Agreement Act, requires the collection of uh, tons of data requires allowing people to talk about what kind of a marketing order, what kind of a system they would like to have. It also uh, is uh, uh, worth noting that USDA is under no obligation whatsoever to create a marketing order that covers the footprint of the political boundaries of the state of California. It could be smaller, it could be two or three orders, it could be bigger than California, it could be uh, Los Angeles and San Diego merged in with the order that's in Phoenix. It could be Northern California by itself. It could be Northern California and picking up Reno, Nevada. So it's, uh, they have full range to consider what they think makes sense under the context of the federal law. How, how would other existing federal market orders likely respond to a promulgation proposal? Uh, California state pricing has price advantages. If you're a cheesemaker or a butter powder manufacturer, you actually have a price advantage. So having uh, those folks paying prices comparable or literally the same as other uh, federal order marketing areas would put them on an even keel. And um, you know, it's for them to say what they think, but uh, that would be a pretty big issue if I were in those commodity sectors in a different state. 2007 or so, Food Lion sued Dean Foods for price fixing, no price fixing. I think Dean won that, and it's on appeal. The Sixth Circuit the opinion is expected to be these many years later. How big a deal is that sued, if you're familiar with it at all? I'm not, I'm not familiar with the details. Of course, Dean Foods and, and DFA have both been involved in uh, some legislative activity, uh, particularly in the Southeast, but in other parts of the state, because one of the characteristics, and of course it's not unique to dairy by any means, is there's just a lot of consolidation. And for a lot of farmers, uh, that degree of consolidation uh, makes one suspicious about, you know, to what extent do I really 
uh, uh, negotiate prices? To what extent uh, are these really fair market prices? Uh, of course, you know, Dean Foods and Food Line, you're going down a supply chain, now you're talking about establishment or retail prices. Uh, I don't know the details of where that's at, uh, but I understand the economics is really driven by structural questions. I think it's absolutely heightened because food retailers are keenly aware of what's going on in the milk industry. You could, you could say, aren't there structural issues for a box of cereal or for uh, you know, cantaloupes? Well, the fact of the matter is not everybody comes into the grocery store and buys a cantaloupe, but 90% of shoppers go into a grocery store and walk out with a dairy product. And beverage milk is one of a small number of items, 10 or 12 items, around which stores compete. The flyer always has something with milk in it. Uh, retailers think that if I put a good price on a gallon of milk, I'll get somebody to come to my store instead of going to the other store. So that, that increases the sensitivity around milk in a way that you wouldn't see in a lot of other products. How valid are the concerns of producers or others that prices are fixed or, or consumers? Uh, do I think there, there's merit to that? I've not seen any evidence to suggest merit to that. And one of the things that I, but I have done is um, research looking at how prices coordinate across market levels. If the farm price goes up and down, does the wholesale price follow? Does the retail price follow? And actually, um, uh, uh, the evidence very strongly suggests that retail, wholesale, and farm prices move together over time. They don't move together month to month. You can certainly find months where they're going in opposite directions. But both just qualitatively looking at a graph, but also statistically doing um, um, more refined analysis, there's a, there's a very clear connection. There are delays. Uh, it takes longer for a price drop to find its way to retail than it does a price increase. Uh, there are differences in magnitude. Price increase will be more fully passed than a price decrease. But actually it's closer than people would imagine and, and in fact retail prices will go down especially with prolonged drops or large drops. Well, one of the things uh, some of the companies said in their annual reports about you know 2010 or so was that the problem in 2009 was that prices for them were going up very fast uh, but they weren't able to pass that along quickly enough to the consumers and I just wonder what were the pressures that kept the consumer price down? Well, of course, 2009 was an income problem. A lot of times when we look at you know, dairy markets or any other food market, there's something particular going on with that, that crop. And so it's a more localized deal. Uh, we had a bad apple harvest, and there's just not apples to be found, and you know, price responds or whatever. But 2009 was a recession. So it was across the board. Dairy wasn't impacted you know, uniquely or particularly differently. Uh, and that changes how a retailer can deal with it, and it changes how a consumer can deal with it. I, you don't just say, well, I'll buy orange juice instead of milk, because your problem is you don't have anything to buy, buy it with in the first place. As I mentioned before, milk is a very sensitive item in a, in a grocery store, and one of the things that uh, is an outcome of that is food retailers routinely employ smoothing techniques. Uh, they'd love to pass along a cost increase. It would make sense to them but they're worried about driving away consumers from their store if they try to put that on too fast. So they play this gentle game between their competitors to see, you know, you got the same cost situation I do, but are you gonna increase the price as fast as I do? And if, you, if I increase it too fast, all my customers are gonna go over to you or a bunch. And so you see this price smoothing. I catch it up on the downside, you know, I lose for a while on the, on the upside. Um, you said that can I add? Okay. All right. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you could talk about dairy internationally and TPP. I'm from afar following what's going on in Bali, which looks like not much. Uh, and then there's an anticipation that there will be these talks in Singapore. What, what, Im well, what do you see happening in all of this? What's the importance of it? Well, uh, uh, you know, the remnants uh, uh, of Doha. Uh, I think are still very much in a coma. Uh, uh, I think it's fairly unlikely 
that the president will get fast track authority and without that it's going to be almost impossible to complete a complicated agreement. And for the, the fact of the matter is the thing that blocked progress on Doha, that equation really hasn't changed. And um, people wish it were otherwise, but it hasn't changed. Uh, and you know these regional uh, bilateral, regional uh, preferential trade agreements are just simpler. They're easier. The range of issues is smaller. Uh, so that makes it a little bit easier. The TPP is, is actually really quite interesting uh, in many ways, but also particularly from a dairy standpoint, because you have two countries that are involved who are the most protectionist dairy countries on the planet. You have a couple of countries involved that are the most free market least protectionist on the planet, and the United States trying to figure out which is better for it, to have access to Japan or to worry about New Zealand having more access to us. Uh, the Canadian involvement in TPP becomes even more interesting because it's our neighbor. Getting milk from Ontario into New York or, or Boston or Philadelphia or the Baltimore, Washington area is easier than getting milk in from Wisconsin. So if we change that free trade relationship that, that we've had with uh, Canada since NAFTA, which is for dairy is not free, we could have a dramatic effect on uh, flow of dairy products between the two countries and oh by the way also completely undermine the federal milk marketing order system. Now, of course, you can negotiate a treaty that would prevent that from happening, but those are the issues that are at stake with the TPP. Could you name these countries that are the most protected? Japan and Canada. Okay. Uh, far and away. Nor Norway is on that list, but uh, Japan and Canada, most protectionists. New Zealand and Australia, very free market, big dairy countries, major exporters. Uh, just one follow-up on that. I ha you mentioned Canada exporting into the United States. But uh, Hillary Clinton once said to me that her great, one of her greatest frustrations as a senator was that she cannot do anything about getting pro, uh, uh, U.S. agricultural products into Canada. She was particularly, I, she didn't mention dairy at that time, but she was talking about cut flowers and how the New York producers want to get into that market. Do you see much potential for U.S. exports to Canada or is the population too small? No, no, actually, uh, you know, of course, Canada is our major trading partner in so many things anyway. Uh, the dairy analysis is actually pretty interesting. Uh, our industry, which has not really been restricted by regional movements, has over the last 50, 60, 100 years, has seen dairy move from the east to the west. And so the western states have grown tremendously. Of course, there's population there. And if you live in New York, you're aware of the availability of milk coming from the west. Canada has adopted a very rigid uh, supply control program that's allocated at the provincial levels so that Quebec and Ontario hold 80% of the milk production, but the opportunity to increase milk production in the western provinces is just as great as it was for us in the western states. Canada milks cows in the east, ships the milk to the west. The United States milks cows in the west and ships product to the east. If we had free trade, Ontario and Quebec would send products south. California, Idaho, Washington, Oregon would send products north. So we'd change the flow directionally. And it wouldn't be that New York would necessarily see any more product from out of state, but it would be from Ontario and Quebec, not from Canada and, and, and Idaho. Oh, excuse me, California and Idaho. And what about U.S. exports into Canada? Do you see much? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in the WTO negotiations, one of the things that we, we negotiated under the Uruguay round was 5% uh, market access as a sort of a general rule. Uh, first 5% comes in before we worry about tariffs. One of the Canadian arguments on the dairy side was they already provided 5% access just from cross-border shopping, from people from Vancouver coming down to Whatcom County, Washington, from people in uh, eastern Ontario and western Quebec coming down across the St. Lawrence River and buying there or coming across the border and buying into Buffalo and going back with a trunk load filled with gallons of milk, which sounds silly, but uh, this actually happens. 
And this was in the U.S. Canadian agreement. This was in the uh, in the Uruguay Round Agreement. Oh, okay. When when the five percent uh, market access rule was being debated, uh, the U.S. said, "Great, we get five percent more." And they said, "Hey, wait a minute! You already got five percent with cross border shopping." We have NAFTA. Yeah, we have NAFTA. We're but you know when we to open cross border trade. To yeah, product, you know uh, the the original Canadian U.S. agreement, CUSTA, which preceded NAFTA. Uh, dairy was a big item. Agriculture was actually a fairly big item, but dairy was was um, a make or break issue. And the way it was resolved was for both Canada and the U.S. to agree. Dairy's off the table. There is no free trade between Canada and the U.S. on dairy products, and we we wanted that as badly as they did. They want it more badly now, but back then it was a mutual and actually pretty easy agreement. You mentioned how Senator Gillibrand you were keenly keenly interested in nutrition programs. You want to wade into what's going on in the farm bill negotiations on food stamps, whether there's a uh, uh, whether there's a, a compromise possible, I, I, I ask this because we've, in the last two days I've had people tell me, that, oh, the you know, House Republicans are much more conciliatory than you think, although they then say, but they really want to see something and they, they want to have toughened work requirements. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, it depends of, on what exactly compromise you're talking about. Obviously, I, I don't know what specifically they, the four principles might be talking about, but I think um, the easy qualification rule that very uh, uh, nicely gets referred to as heat and eat, I, you know, I think they're going to make it, uh, an arrangement on that. Are they going to have some kind of uh, uh, a, a, a co-responsibility sort of requirement that somehow um, requires or gives incentives to food stamp recipients to do something that sounds like self-help. Maybe it's work-related. Uh, yeah, that'll probably be in there. And I think those sorts of things can get past um, uh, Republicans and Democrats because, you know, Democrats don't want to move in that direction. Republicans don't want to move in the other. So you have to keep them both on the same page. Uh, I think at the end of the day, though, the, the key is going to be whether or not Speaker Boehner and Mr. Cantor uh, stick to the Hassard rule. Because, you know, the reality is they don't even have to bring it to the floor for a vote. There's nothing that obliges uh, the leadership of the House to have a vote on the conference report. And if they stick to the Hassard rule, they're going to have a problem. If they just go to an open floor, uh, they're going to get, I think, uh, a, a simple majority with a lot of Democrats and a few Republicans. And that's that's the key uh, to whether or not there's going to be a farm bill. You know, farm bills used to be pretty, farm bill season used to be pretty predictable. Is that era ended, or is, is this farm bill struggles and angst the, sort of the new normal going forward? You know, I don't think we know that <clears throat> based on uh, 112th or 113th Congress. Uh, obviously, uh, Congress today, the House of Representatives today, is divisive in ways that no one can remember. Uh, I read an article um, oh, maybe about a year ago where some political scientists said this is the most divisive Congress since Reconstruction. Wow. Uh, so if, you, if the question is, suppose we had a little different Congress, one that was more amenable to compromise, could we get back to doing a farm and food bill in a more normal way? I, I'd say, yeah, uh, I think we, sh we, we, we should give that a shot before we proclaim farm bills dead. But there certainly are more challenges to passing agricultural legislation in the 21st century simply because people don't understand farming anymore. And things that uh, that make a lot of sense to agriculture just don't make any sense to folks that don't know anything about agriculture, and they don't want to really listen to your explanation. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> yesterday, your dean put out a statement that it's really important to pass the farm bill. 
Uh, are you in agreement with that? I mean, are you? Uh, what's your view on the importance of passing the bill, uh, rather than an extension or letting permanent law go into effect? Oh, well, uh, permanent law would be a nightmare. So that that almost goes without saying. And I can talk about the dairy part of that if you'd like. Uh, uh, a Extension, a two-year extension, which is a pretty popular scenario, is a political disaster. It's not an economic disaster. So what's your criteria for saying we need to pass a farm bill? Um, you know, uh, we should. I would definitely agree. Uh, but I don't think um, failure to do so is, uh, by any shape, uh, an economic disaster for the broad sweep of agriculture. What about... What about for New York? Because there's a lot of talk about <clears throat> these programs like fruits and vegetables, beginning farmers, all the little programs that would help states like New York more than the commodity producing states. Those are good programs for New York and other northeastern states, mm -hmm. uh, no question about it. Uh, but they're not make or break it. What's your basis for thinking that it would be a political disaster? Who would pay the price? Uh, the uh, agricultural leaders, the agriculturally oriented uh, senators and congressmen who have constituents that would hold them accountable for that failure. Uh, this would by no means be like you know the majority of the United States Congress, but there would be some people who would have a problem because of that. Uh, you know, the reality is there are a lot of districts where not passing a farm bill would be seen as a victory. And so, uh, you know, for those guys, if they're part of the people that voted no, they might get rewarded for that. Well, but, I mean, the agricultural leaders, wouldn't they, aren't they seen by their constituents as they're working hard, it's those darn Democrats or darn Republicans, it's the non-ag people, the people who don't get the industry. They're the hang-up, but we, Senator Stabenow, Chair, you know, Chairman Lucas, they're fighting hard. Why would they pay a price? Again, it depends, I think, in particular on their constituents, but every time you have to explain why you didn't get something done, you're losing. And so it opens a door for a challenger to say, you know, I, I could do a better job. And, and you know, uh, that's debatable, but nevertheless, it opens that door. Right about transportation for many years, and they would extend the authorization bill you know, many, many times. Every single time it was declared a disaster, and it never was. Yeah. It was a hassle. Yeah. And, and bad policy, maybe. But, you know, yeah. So. And you know, one of the interesting things uh, <coughs> about uh, this farm bill and some of the things we're debating that, that is not necessarily generally well known is there are some programs that end, that are authorized under the, this bill and stop. There's a big chunk of programs that don't end. If we didn't pass a farm bill, they would continue, and food stamps is one of them. We don't need to pass legislation to have the farm bill continue on autopilot. Uh, it's an unusual program in that its authorization actually can come through the Appropriations Committee, even though it's a mandatory spending program. So if I were really keen on leaving food stamps alone, and I could care less about agriculture, the easiest thing for me to do would be to vote against the Farm Bill. Food stamps will go on as they are. Just a quick question about Texas. I'm fairly new here. Uh, how big a role are there five people who spot the Texans on the committee? Are they in the House, down in the Senate? Are they, is this, this, are there significant players in the Texas delegation? Uh, yes, uh, and of course, the, at the end of the day, the conference report goes out if it gets a majority of the senators and a majority of the representatives. And in the case of the House, you have to subtract off the five or six that are representatives only for specific sections of the bill. So it's in a little smaller group. And that increases the importance of any group that hangs together as a coalition. Uh, Southern Plains, Southern interests are different than Corn Belt or East Coast, West Coast interests. So it does give them uh, a little more leverage uh, uh, in, in, in the simple fact of everybody gets one vote that has to add up to the majority.
tomorrow. Uh, Saturday, actually. I've got a full day tomorrow. We go back Saturday. So. Yeah, I got a full day today, and um, uh, tomorrow is a little bit more relaxed. But I'm going to spend some time over at USDA in particular. So. Is there anything in the Farm Bill, I mean, that addresses sort of the, for lack of a better word, the agrarian movement? I mean, Wendell Berry and the other folks, the organic folks, but also in his case, is speaking up for sort of smaller farming operations. Is that? Are there winners and losers at all in that regard? In that? Well, you know, this is very. This is a really important segment in Northeast agriculture, and it's something that we probably spend more time thinking about than, than uh, you know, the the big agricultural states. Uh, and I would say our, our feeling is it's not a winner loser deal. That there's market segmentation that's going on. That you know the smaller scale and the organic and uh, local foods and the CSAs uh, occupy a market niche. In fact, maybe even increase awareness about a product that might actually have spillover effects that are good for other parts of agriculture. Like, you know, um, obviously, like there's organic producers and small-scale farms that are creating niche products. Maybe. But in terms of sort of the overall um, health of the agricultural system, which somebody like Wendell Berry has been arguing, you know, is, um, is poisoned in a sense by the over-reliance on these giant mm -hmm. operations. And I'm just wondering, is there anything in the bill that would address that concern or make it worse? I mean, that's what I meant by winners and losers. Yeah, no, I, uh, not surprisingly, when you get to the to a national level, there's a good deal of homogenization that occurs in what's important. So it's all good. We want everyone to succeed. We're not going to try to stack the deck in favor of one or the other. Now, you could argue that traditional programs, uh, Title I programs, stack the deck against an organic producer, or even especially crop producer, which could be a very large scale guy. And so we've created programs for that. You know, Know Your Farmer and uh, the Organic Certification Program. You know, the rather considerable dollars that are now uh, oriented towards specialty crops. That That's the way Washington deals with, with trying to create a something for everybody. And, uh, not so much by saying, yeah, you're right, we spend too much time on major crops. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that doesn't achieve everybody's objective, but I think that's, that's how these things inevitably come together. And, and um, you know, everybody would like more, but I think uh, especially crops and uh, a lot of the smaller scale and, and organic uh, folks are, are really very pleased with the gains they made, uh, particularly since 2008. And that doesn't seem to be under any great challenge now. There have been, in California, there have been focused on constitutional challenges to uh, special crop promotion programs. They tend to fail, though, with some success at the state court level. I, I'm just curious, is there any challenge afoot, either from outside or within, to the dairy promotion programs? Uh, there has been. Uh, in fact, there was an important Supreme Court case a number of years ago that clarified that um, following the rules of a majority vote, approving a checkoff program, that the fact that you didn't vote with a majority and don't like it uh, isn't going to provide you any kind of exemption. And if you say, I don't like the message of the program, uh, that's you know sort of too bad. But it was the Supreme Court clarified that this was not a classic freedom of speech issue because this uh, these checkoff programs resulted in what was what's identified as government speech and is not protected by the freedom right, of speech so since rules. That, since that case, is that, did that pretty much settle the, the legal challenges? The You'd have to come at it from a different angle. Now, to be sure, there are some disgruntled producers who would like to revisit it, but uh, clearly a legal strategy would have to be formulated that was different from the one that's already been settled. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Nice to visit with you.